Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another V Brown Bag webinar. We are continuing our series on NSXT tonight with Britton Johnson. Tonight, we're going to hear about routing and switching from Britain. But before we do, a few housekeeping notes. If I can advance the slide, there we go. Uh, remember, please, that this is a social show. If you're watching us live, you can use the QA box in Zoom, or you can interact with us using the hashtag VBrownBag on Twitter, and we will be monitoring your questions and passing them to Britain as long as they aren't too snarky. A little snark is okay, though. Um, we have other shows as well, so be sure to check them at the times and dates listed you see here on the right as well. And if you missed uh, the previous episode that kicked off this series or any of our other previous recordings, check out the V Brown Bag YouTube channel. Uh, I'm your host, Ken Nalbone, and with us again tonight is Britton Johnson. I'm going to hand it over to you now, Britton. Say hello to the people while I give you control. Howdy, howdy, everyone. All right. Let me attempt to share. Go for it. And let's start this. All right. All right. I have too many screens. This is my notes are on the wrong screen. I see this slide that says NSXT switching and routing. So all right. it's good for so, me. All right. Welcome everybody to episode number two out of the series of four that we're doing on NSXT. Um, and again, most of this will be centered around NSXT version 2.5 slash 2.4 or somewhere in there, primarily because the 2.4 is the base version that the current VCP NV 2020 exam is all about. So if you're using this time right now to study for the VCP NV 2020 um, content, should be very relevant for that particular exam. Um, yes, it is true that NSXT 3.0 is coming very soon, but this today is still very valid information. So quick agenda, um, I'm going to skip the introduction. If you want to know who I am, you can watch the first part of the last one. Um, uh, we're going to run through some foundations concepts, key concepts for again for NSXT data center. Um, we'll run through profiles, what those are. Um, there's a lot of them. And we'll look at, you know, logical segments, what we kind of term as, you know, how networking is sort of connected in the environment. Um, design and implementation considerations is sort of a rough agenda. Um, you know, and I'll throw in some, um, some kind of good examples of how things are built in, at the very end. Um, and as questions come up, certainly, Ken, feel free to interrupt me. I'm not watching the chat or the questions, so. Oh, I'll interrupt you, all right. Yeah, okay. So uh, secondarily agenda part of this is resources. Um, the most important thing um, while going through this is, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm going through and a lot of stuff that, you know, anybody, you know, anybody wants to learn anything about NSX or even, you know, if you're a customer who's using NSX in production, um, always keep a current copy of the NSXT reference design guide happy or and well keep it happy yes that would keep you happy keep it you know available um, the and again highlighted on this slide it's this this design guide 2.0 um, that is not to be intentionally confusing it's the guide version number so the version of the book um, the, the software version is for 2.5 the book version is for 2.0 um, that is the current release so if you have questions about any of this stuff, um, this is your Bible and this is the, where you go to get answers. So check that out. Uh, other thing I like to highlight, if you are a partner of VMware, if you work for a partner, um, you know, like Ken at, at Ahead, um, if, if you work for a partner and you are interested in deep dive advanced training for partners, um, check out Live Fire Solutions. This is a division of VMware that does special, specialized training um, on all of our products. Um, they do spe specifically also some stuff on NSXT. They are branching out into some virtual classes. They have a really good one out there right now for um, NSXT and Kubernetes. Um, you can check that out. Um, but LiveFire, the LiveFire team in general, they're a global team of, of solution architects and trainers, and they do an amazing job of producing a lot of things. And I want to give them a shout out of how awesome they are because I borrowed a lot of the content for today from them. So 
kudos to the live fire team. Um, last hands-on labs. Uh, we always talk about this, of course, at VMware hands-on labs are, you know, crucial product learning tool for what we're trying to do to educate customers, um, around NSXT and, and the like. Um, and also I want to, um, just pop out of my deck quickly here. Because, um, as I, I kind of explained this to, to Ken before we started this, but today with, with the how we have to kind of talk through routing and switching, there's not really a super lot of great ways to demonstrate a lot of that. Um, the one thing I will suggest, though, is if you go into the hands-on labs and start this up, you can even do it while you're listening to me chat about this stuff. Um, it, might, it might kind of give you a good um, baseline um, of how things and, and cement some of these concepts and give you a place to work through how this works. Um, if you start up this hands-on labs 2026 um, and go through module three logical routing and even some of the you know module two for you know logical switching, you know that will talk you through kind of the basics of creating some of these stuffs and it'll step you through the process of what it looks like. Um, you know it's it's a very good lab. You know these just these couple of things to run through really don't take that long to run through. And, and, and quite frankly, I think it's one of the better ways to get yourself, you know, knee deep in the product and see how it works. So um, if you're bored listening, watching to me, you know, log into the lab and take a look at that. But uh, that's my other piece of advice to take a look at here. All right, jump back here. Okay. All right, should have the slides back, right? It's like being back home. All right, good. So let's do this. Foundations and concepts. We'll just kind of kick it off with a little bit of a terminology review. Um, so kind of like we talked about the first one, you know, the, one of the bigger um, hills to climb, as it were, in the, in the transition from NSXV to NSXT is terminology. Um, we just, you know felt we had to kind of change kind of how we talk about things um, between the two products. Um, not only does it help designate which product you're talking about when you're having conversations about it, um, it also kind of changes a little bit of how you have to talk about things and build solutions in your head um, when you're talking through these things. So, you know, again, to first start off with this idea of a transport node. So, you know, transport nodes are really anything that is under NSX management. Um, so that's, you know, hypervisors, edge nodes, bare metal servers, um, you know, anything with an NSX agent, um, you know, these are things that, you know, are controlled by NSX and, and, you know, for, for all intents and purposes are managed by the, their networking specifically is managed by NSX. So we refer to them as transport nodes. Um, it's not, you know, the you'll, you'll see, sometimes see the term host exchange for transport node, but they're kind of one in the same ish. Um, and then also on top of that, you know, the, you know, the NSX virtual distributed switch or the NVDS is the software component that kind of bridges all those things together. So, um, again, like we've talked about a little bit the last time, the, the old way of doing things was you'd have a virtual distributed switch that was controlled by a vCenter, you know, as a part of a, that, that was a vSphere construct. Um, it was managed by vCenter and by vSphere and controlled and deployed in, into clusters, you know, through that interface. The NVDS is an NSX construct. It is controlled, owned, and managed by NSX, and it is deployed into your clusters um, through the NSX manager's connection to vCenter. Um, and so it is, not, it is a wholly separate component um, that gets injected into your workload, man, you know, clusters, it's, you know, but it's managed by NSX. So. And, and so we have, a, we have a question. Yes. Uh, on that note, uh, do NICs have to be dedicated to NSXT? So yes, typically, you know, we'll have at least, um, you know, a couple of network interfaces dedicated to the NVDS, you know, for redundancy's sake. Um, so if you're in an environment where you are migrating from V to T, you know, yeah, hopefully you've got enough overhead, you know, network adapters in that equipment to kind of split your traffic while you're in the process of migrating. Um, that is one of the one challenge we have seen. 
um, where you know customers have limited amount of network adapters on their hosts and as, as they're migrating over it, but they're not necessarily upgrading hardware. Um, yeah, you got to have some ability to migrate those things over. And then, you know, kind of as the last bullet shows here, you know, the NVDS name is assigned, you know, to that uh, for, you know, grouping and management. And, and one of the uh, good, good clues there is as you're documenting things out is in, include those NVDS names in your documentation. Okay. So then we have transport zones. So, you know, the transport zone defines the span of a logical network. Um, you know, we could have, you know, I mean, we can have two different types of transport zones in NSXT. Um, prior, you know, NSX for vSphere, we had transport zones, but they were kind of, you know, you know, just a thing in software that, you know, said, you know, these two clusters are on the same transport zone. They can talk to each other but a third cluster that's not a member of that same transport zone can't talk to it. So this is a little bit different where we have, we have kind of that same methodology, except now we can do things with a straight, a straight up transport zone overlay, or we can do it as a you know, VLAN backed, um, which kind of allows you know, some layer two connectivity to physical networks and things of that nature. Um, the, 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 the choice of you know, whether to go full overlay or VLAN backed, ultimately is dependent upon your physical underlay network and what you're doing with that. Um, there are cases where um, some, some organizations don't like the idea of having a straight overlay network and so they want to rely on the underlying um, physical fabric to be able to, to provide that, you know, underlying connectivity via, you know, existing VLANs. So that's where we just, you know, rely on that. The advantage is when you do straight overlay, you want to create more networks, you just create them. Um, if you're doing VLAN backed, you can create them, but then you also have to create the associated VLANs on the physical fabric. So it's a little bit of an extra step to do the VLAN back side. While you're pausing, we have a question. Relating back to the previous talk about the switching. Um, Mama wants to know, or he says, I assume we can have management, vMotion, and vSAN traffic can be on a VDS. Correct. Um, we actually do have support, supported models for migrating that, those particular traffic um, flows into NVDS back networks. So it, it is part of our design philosophy where um, if you have, especially if you have limited you know, physical adapters on a host, um, you know, we can move those VM kernel adapters uh, into logical switches that are NVDS backed. So we can do vSAN traffic and things like that, and you know, vMotion traffic and things like that um, over the NVDS backed network. So vSphere, VDS, NVDS, take your pick. Yeah, it just you know, depends on, like, it's the standard engineering answer, it depends. Okay, last piece of terminology, the edge node. Um, so edge nodes are, you know, again, they're appliances that are, you know, specific for doing, you know, it's, it's, it's not unlike the old edge services gateways, um, but more. So, you know, they, they give you specific pools of capacity and, you know, and, uh, the the way that I kind of talk about this is you know if you if you're doing um, additional services, you know like um, edge firewalling, load balancing, VPN services, those kinds of things, those are where the edge nodes come into play, and then those kind of services are what the edge nodes ultimately are about. And we'll get deeper into that here in a bit. Okay, so one thing you will notice in NSXT is the use of profiles, and there are a lot of them. Um, you know, this is something that you need to become familiar and comfortable with where to use them and how to configure them. Um, it figures heavily in the discussion when you're, you know, learning about NSXT. Um, it also figures heavily for the exam. So, you know, definitely brush up on your profiles and where and when to apply them. 
So the most important thing when building an uplink profile, you know, especially when you're, you, if you're building something with lags, um, again, is to, to refer back to that NSXT design guide um, because there is specific guidance around using bonded physical ports on physical fabric. Um, and so, you know, kind of in the, as it lays out in the grouping here, I mean, you can have, um, you know, multiple NICs part of a lag. You can do independent NICs on, on, on these uplinks. Um, you know, a lot of different combinations are possible. And, you know, it's, it's a horrible answer, but again, the, the standard engineering of an answer of it depends on your requirements um, definitely applies. And I've seen um, many a customer have long, long discussions about how they want to do this because um, ultimately it comes down to a couple of things. It comes down to, you know, all, overall throughput, you know, what kind of throughput you need on, a, on, on these transport nodes and ultimately what kind of redundancy you need. And, and those are kind of the biggest um, things you have to kind of talk through and figure out for your environment, you know, which does vary. So teaming policies, um, they define how the NVDS uses its uplink for redundancy and traffic load balancing. Uh, teaming policies apply to uplinks and, you know, and like, like it shows here, there's really nothing to do with as physical NICs or lags. You know, the teaming policy kind of, you know, shows, you know, how uh, traffic is going to flow out, you know, uh, from workload to workload. The uplink profile is a template that defines how an NVDS connects to the physical network. The uplink profile is applied to a transport node when it joins the transport zone. Um, so we, you know, again, we specify, you know, if, if lags are involved or individual ports, the teaming policy that we just talked about, you know, the MTU of the NICs as well as, you know, overlay connectivity. These are some examples of what, what that looks like. And again, you know, the, the uplink profile, you know, you kind of have to match most of what that is going to look like per host. In some cases, um, you know, if you have matching hosts, you know, then you can create one uplink profile that, that is a blanket profile for, you know, all just your ESXi nodes. Or if you have, uh, you know, a specific other type of host that maybe has, you know, less physical NICs available to it, then you can build a specific profile for that. This is where, you know, when you're designing out your, your, your backend infrastructure part of NSXT, um, knowing what kind of equipment you have is really crucial so that you can make the profiles and, and tune them properly so that things, you know, you don't have problems later on. This is some of the, the ground, ground wall foundation stuff that you're doing when you're building up these profiles. So would uh, the uh, design guide you, the reference design guide you talked about earlier, be a good place for people to look when they're kind of going down that route, trying to figure Absolutely. out what's going for them? Yes, because and that, that will cut through a lot of the different options that are available when you're going through these things. Um, and, and, and two, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of information. When you go through the design, it, the design guide is massive. Um, and, and, and it's good because it's, you know, it, we try to cover every, op, every possible scenario that we could think of. Um, so, you know, the, the design guide, you know, when in, all, when in doubt, go back to the design guide because that is where we're going to default our, our response to most, most of the time. Um, you know, or if you have other, if you run across a scenario that you do have a question, you know, definitely reach out to your friendly neighborhood NSXSE um, or your partner of choice. So tunnel endpoints, we kind of talked about this in the last one a little bit. Um, this is uh, back in the NSX for vSphere days, this is what we called uh, the VTEP or the VXLAN tunnel endpoint. Uh, we've, we've dropped the V and it's just now called a TEP. 
Um, TEPs are used for the interconnecting of the transport nodes and building the transport network. Um, you know, so this is how each host or each hypervisor host um, communicates one to the next. This is how we build the overlay. Um, you know, the, the, if, you, if you were looking at the physical, if, you know, if you were sniffing the physical IP traffic um, between hosts, you know, you'd see these TEP IP addresses at the front of the head, at the front of the line. Um, but we don't hide anything inside of the overlays. So even if you did, you know, you know, grab all that traffic, you you even could could see the, the Geneve overlay packets as well. Um, so IP assignment, you know, needs to be designed defined during transport node creation. Um, you know, so there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Um, IP subnet capacity planning here is critical. Um, I have seen many a customer, even on back in the vSphere days. Um, under provision their TEP networks, you know, only to cause major capacity issues down the road. Um, you know, people will sometimes, when they're building things out, they'll, you know, be given a large subnet to cover the whole thing, and then they'll take a tiny portion of that subnet and assign it to their, you know, TEP networks and say, you know, okay, well, you, we've got X number of hosts, so we really only need X number of IPs for the TEPs, and then they don't consider that, okay, you know, a year from now, we're going to double in size, and we're going to need way more than that. And then, what kind of, you know, issues that might cause down the road? And, and generally speaking, you know, these these TEP networks, you know, they don't talk to anything but their neighbor. So it's not like you really have to overly consider routing planning and all that kind of stuff on this network. This is a network that's just there for to, to manage the overlay. Um, so it's it's easy to overthink it, and it's easy to under provision it. Um, so my my Critical warning to everybody in this is don't under provision it, make it bigger than you need because you're just, you'll, you will save either yourself or somebody else um, a major headache down the road. Britton, speaking of provisioning address space, uh, Graham wonders can TEPs be IPv6? And for that matter, can everything in NSXT be IPv6? Uh, good question. Um, I have not seen that in, the, in any, any guidance anywhere. Um, I, so I would imagine that is it is unlikely. Um, I mean, IPv6 is supported in components in NSXT, but I don't believe that it is supported for the this underlying foundational networking. Gotcha. I'll have to double check that though. Sounds good. Network IO control. Uh, so network IO control profiles manage traffic contention on the uplinks of a uh, hypervisor. Um, you know, and this is vSphere only in this case. Um, and, and ultimately this is ensuring that we don't saturate the uplink of a node. Um, you know, this is nothing super new. We've had this in vSphere for a while in various forms. Um, this is just our um, way to do it in NSX. Transport node profiles. Um, the transport node profile is a template for creating a transport node that can be applied to a group of hosts in one single shot. Um, so this is where, you know, yeah, you say you've got a, a given cluster and, you know, all you want all that, all the hosts in that cluster configured identi identically. Um, you know, especially if you're doing the initial um, preparation of those hosts, this is where you'd kind of set that profile up to, you know, build um, NSXT from the ground up. So kind of putting things together, you know, when you're layering all this stuff in, you know, we, we have, you know, we create a VLAN transport zone, we create the, the overlay transport zone, you know, then name it the same, you know, to kind of follow things through. Define the uplink profile for ESXi, define it for KVM if you're using KVM. Um, add hosts to the transport zones and attach the uplink profile. Assign your physical next to the uplinks. And the result is you have hosts using you know, the same logical switches. Transport nodes are connected to you know, different transport VLANs and it's using different uplink configurations. And this is all, in this, in this example, it's across you know, two different hypervisors, but they get the same capabilities. And we all lived in harmony. Right. 
So that's sort of the underlying how things work between hosts connecting those together. Um, next is our logical segments. Cruising right along. So the, the logical segments piece of this, um, you know, we used to call them logical switches. And again, this is our terminology update. Now we call them, refer to them as segments because um, it's not really a switch, it's software. So we call it a segment. Um, and this is kind of an example packet flow um, of how a logical segment works. So we do a lookup for a MAC address. Um, you know, if it's a hit, the frame gets encapsulated. You know, it sends unicast to the remote TEP. And if, you know, if we don't find it, then the frame's just going to flood the network looking for that other, you know, response. So Geneve, uh, as I mentioned, is the replacement protocol for VXLAN. Uh, this is the detailed breakdown of what the frame is made of. Um, I, I feel like a real networking person could stare at this for a very long time um, and, and, and gain lots of knowledge from it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite there yet to, to be able to understand every tiny little bit of this. I'm learning as much as everybody else is. Um, but, you know, I think the, the interesting part to the, of this to me is how, you know, the original Ethernet frame, you know, is contained in the very smallest little bit. And this sort of is a good primer and expl an ex explanation example um, of how or why we need jumbo frames in the environment, you know, because of all this extra stuff um, that has to, be, has to be added on, um, you know, to get our TEP information in there. Um, getting this, you know, the source port, destination port, you know, and all of these various aspects that make up the total, you know, Geneva encapsulated frame that makes up our overlay network and makes it happen. I already have it memorized for the quiz later. Good. So ARP suppression is sort of handled this way where the, the NVDS learns the MAC to IP association by snooping ARP and DHCP traffic. Um, information is then pushed to the central control cluster. And, you know, again, if, if ARP does not get an answer, then it floods the network to find it. So who's, who's ARPing in this situation? Is it like a VM is ARPing to find the Mac of another mm -hmm. VM? Correct. Okay. And it's one of these scenarios where, where once the, you know, once NSX learns, you know, a route, you know, it's going to retain that in the NVDS so that it doesn't have to keep, keep doing it over and over and over again. Unless of, course the, unless, of course, the machine moves. They can do that? Right, yeah. Segment profiles. So I, for IP discovery, ARP snooping inspects the VM outgoing ARP and GARP to learn the VM and MAC IP addresses. Um, ARP snooping is applicable if the VM uses a static IP address instead of DHCP. Um, so, and then DHCP snooping inspects the DHCP packets exchanged between the VM and the DHCP client and the DHCP server. Um, So the segment security part, I'll have to look at, you know, that a little bit further as we get into our uh, security session uh, next time on the vBrown bag. Some general considerations, um, you know, these are again, items you should know for the exam specifically, um, you know, Obviously, we want to ensure IP connectivity between the hosts. You know, that is, you know, we, we don't care what the IP connectivity is. It just needs to be there, and they need to be able to talk to each other, and that TEP network needs to be rock solid. Um, you know, that, that's, you know, level one. Um, and, and you'll start to see this talk of, you know, we used to talk exclusively about MTU size of 1600, um, but realistically, with Geneve, uh, you know, 1700 is kind of the new minimum. Um, 1600 is still the official minimum. Um, but this is again where we say, you know, if you're enabling jumbo frames, you know, on a physical network, 
may as well just turn it on and turn it all the way up. Um, and that way you don't have to worry about it ever. Turn the MTU dial to 11 is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. And again, a good practice, you know, put your NVIDIA's name um, in the transport zone or name to the transport zone in your documentation. All right, logical routing. So, NSX offers, you know, lots of different ways to do routing in NSXT. Um, you know, but you'll, you'll see a lot of talk about single tier topologies where uh, workloads are connected to a, a, a tier zero or a T zero router and that T0 logical router is connected to a northbound infrastructure. Um, but we also have this capability of doing multi-tenancy, um, which allows you to have separate tenants and provide control boundaries in terms of who controls what. So let's look at that. So the unit of configuration for NSXT, again, is called a logical router. Um, if you create NSX logical networks and you want interconnectivity between them, you know, you have to define um, a logical router object. Um, then you define a default gateway for each of these networks on the logical router. These are called the, the downlink ports. And then let's say you want to, you know, exit the NSX domain and peer with the physical. You know, the logical router is also capable of static and dynamic routing for north-south connectivity to the outside world. And then for, for services, we can enable, you know, a variety of, of services on top of that, um, be it, you know, natting, load balancing, perimeter firewall, all of the standard services you should expect from a, from a network service. So looking at the, how this works, the, the logical router we create is, 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 is you know, or how it's actually manifested in the system. We have a distributed component and a service component. Um, so distributed routing, you know, in a traditional routing world, if you want to send traffic from network A to network B, the traffic needs to trombone the physical world where a router is running, do a lookup and come back. You know, in NSX, we provide a feature called distributed routing for east-west routing, you know, and, and that distributed router functionality r runs as a kernel module within the hypervisor and provides, you know, optimized routing for east-west. So and we'll look at sort of how that's, you know, distributed throughout the system here in a second. So quick question from Nick. Um, are the NSX V ULRs, Universal Logical Router, if I remember correctly, are they Correct. deprecated in T? Yes. Um, all of the uh, universal components and functions that were in vSphere um, as in, in terms of the the construct of that idea um, is no more. Um, you know we are moving forward. Um, so in, in to quickly give an an answer to that uh, in in 2.4 2.5 today um, we have a methodology for doing active active and active standby. You know in split sites um, you know disparate sites. So we would say you have a primary data center and a backup data center. Um, we have a, a methodology for doing, you know, active, active, and failover of that, but it's not the same as, you know, the universal objects that you would create in NSX for vSphere. Um, like I said, in the first episode, if you go back and watch it, you know, anything in the NSX for vSphere world knowledge-wise that you had, just throw it away um, and, and try to kind of relearn a little bit of this stuff. Um, but in, in, going, in going forward, um, as 3.0 comes out and other versions of it in the future, um, we're moving to a model of full federation in the environment so that one construct that you build in one, one data center can move seamlessly to another data center um, so that you don't need those universal objects. They're just federated between, and it's a simple, you know, full fabric across the entire environment. Got it. Now, if I'm reading this slide correctly, uh, basic layer three routing between VMs on different, you know, IP spaces can happen in the, in the distributed router. 
meaning if those VMs are on the same host, they don't need to leave the host to go to some layer three Correct. device to talk to each other unless Correct. they need to traverse some of those enhanced services like the traffic's natted or load balanced or whatever the case may be. Then they would need to go through that, that edge uh, service, that edge node, regardless correct. of wherever that is, and may need to leave the host in that case. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Any, any time that you are, you know, yes. Um, requiring traffic to go through, you know, one of those services that then you're going to have to pass through the services router at that point. And it's one of the things of, you know, we create it for you. Um, you know, it, it, it's just the services component is responsible for providing, providing that on off, you know, gateway functionality or other centralized services. Um, and you know, it's part of the edge nodes. So how do we do this? Um, here, this is a, a combo view of, you know, the, the user interface and then how we actually um, would build this out in a model. Um, so here is, you know, connecting the logical switches into the tier zero. We push then that distributed router down to the hypervisors so that it's fully distributed to all of them. And it, you know, creates this, the same construct on each host. And then we, you know, share the routes between all the hosts so they all know where to go. And again, traffic can go, you know, connect from one to the other. And via the overlay, we can go directly from host to host um, without having to, ex you know, traverse an external router. And so vice Tim, versa. Um, so, sorry, Britton, to interrupt. Uh, Tim is wondering uh, if this is, how this would all work in a, a UCS environment would be any different. I guess I'm not sure what he means by that. That's a good question. Uh, Tim, if you want to maybe clarify that, I'll send it Britain's way. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that offline later. UCS can mean many things. Cisco UCS, sorry. What? Yeah, but, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> sure. Still can mean many things. It could be, you know, hypervisor UCS, could be switch UCS. So logical router service component, the services router. Um, the main thing to note here is we will automatically create the services router when any of these services are turned on. So, um, you know, again, for north-south connectivity, you know, we need to define an uplink on the logical router um, and, you know, turn on the connectivity for that. For, for north-south routing, we have a services component, which is not necessarily distributed to all hypervisors. Um, you know, the services component, again, acts as that on-off gateway, and that's where, yeah, whereas we just talked about, you know, if it needs to traverse that, then it's going to have to go through a specific host to get there. So let's look at some multi-tier models. Doing okay on time. Um, the tier zero still exchanges routes with the physical router. Um, you know, different tier one routers become the first top routers for their specific tenants. Um, when you're making a decision about whether to run, you know, single tiered routing topology or multi-tiered routing topologies, you need to think, think about a couple of things. Um, do you want multiple tenants or departments in your network infrastructure that need isolation? Um, if you're a service provider or, a, you know, a managed service provider, you know, do you want to define, define control boundaries as to who controls what? Um, you know, are you leveraging a cloud management platform? Um, you know, how, how are, what are the different variables of, you know, the level of, you know, separation that you need in your environment? And a lot of that is going to determine, you know, how you build, build out your routing topology in NSXT. Uh, so another question that came in, um, Mithun, wants to know, is it, Mithun wants to know if you can use tiers for PCI or HIPAA separation. Yes. So that is, that is part of the idea with, with the separation of this is, you know, what you, you can have a, a you know, a, a single, you know, tier zero router is sort of your main um, connectivity area. And then if you have specific workloads that you want to be able to isolate um, without, separating them into another transport zone, 
Um, you can stand up, you know, a, a tier one router, put the workload inside of that, and then you know you just basically only allow what networks you want from that tier zero into that tier one routed network, which PCI would fall under that. And this is just an example again of the fully distributed architecture, you know, showing how we do, you know, all this routing up front so that we don't have to um, do it at the source or trombone outside of it. I feel like I'm going really fast. I feel like everybody is just loving what you're saying. So they have fewer questions for you, maybe. <laughs> All right. I know, like, I, like, I wish there was a better way for me to demo this, but there's, I just, I, there's too much information to get through. Nick says so, he loves it. Keep rolling. So layer two bridging. Uh, what about, you know, physical layer two networks? This comes up all the time, um, you know, and it's built right into the design capabilities of NSXT. Um, you know, this is probably, uh, if it's not the numbered two question, it's, you know, the number three question. You know, the first question I usually get is how, how people do micro segmentation and, you know, firewalling and security. Um, that's probably question number one that I get from customers. The second question is usually, what about physical? Um, always comes up and, and, you know, there's again, a myriad of ways to deal with it. Um, it just depends on how you want to deploy it out. And use case is key here. Um, you know, what do you want to connect on layer two? What other network services do you need to provide layer two network connectivity to? Um, you know, there's just an, an endless amount of it depends type questions that you have to kind of talk through. Um, you know, we have the ability again to, you know, lay an edge node in between your physical VLANs and your overlay. And that edge node can, you know, be the physical, you know, bare metal edge node or a virtual edge node. Um, you know, we can get you layer two connectivity to those physical devices that way. Um, Oh, and and even as it connects into you know yes a you know tier zero or tier one route, routed topology. Um, otherwise, if you just want to do you know a simple bridging between an overlay network and a physical router, um, you know then we we can also do that again with the edge nodes. Um, and so you know bridging the logical switch to a physical VLAN, you know in and this is a horrible picture. If I apologize. Um, you know, this is, this is where we, you know, stand up in the environment, um, a bridge to a VLAN to allow that, that transport zone and that logical network um, to get right into um, a physical VLAN. So, you know, especially if you're doing a VLAN, a, a virtual machine migration, you know, a virtual, you're converting it from a VM into, or from a physical machine into a VM, you know, this is how we can enable that connectivity. Um, the other way to do it is a, device called the service interface. Uh, we used to call it the centralized service port. Um, this is on a tier one or tier zero interface connecting a VLAN segment, you know, directly to a physical back to VLAN. Um, you know, the service interface is connected to overlay segments for tier one standalone load balancer use, um, you know, or just providing that physical VLAN connectivity into your virtual network. And again, in this, in this sort of scenario too, you know, if you want to, you know, move those network gateways, you know, from that physical VLAN into an NSX back network, this is another way you can do that, which then allows you to apply to, allows you to apply some security policies into your physical environment. Okay. High availability. Um, shifting gears a little bit and talking about high availability for some of these services. So how we get there uh, on the edge side of things, you know, because you know, on, the, on the virtual side of things, you know, it's, it's all virtual, it's vSphere, it's, you know, high availability sort of built into the environment. Um, but for edge clusters, you know, we build these things, you know, ed edge nodes, we build these things called edge clusters. Um, and, you know, before we get into the 
HA for logical routers, the, the different, con, you know, the, the edge cluster is a little bit different. Um, so edge clustering is simply a grouping of edge nodes for scale out and redundancy. You can have up to 10 edge nodes in a cluster. Is there a minimum? I believe it's two. You can't have a cluster of one? What a ripoff. You, well, you can, but it won't be highly available. So we have kind of two HA modes available, active, 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 standby. Um, and you know how HA works in an NSXT domain, you know, the, the thing to highlight here is um, it's not necessarily the nodes that are running in a active, active or active standby mode, it's the services running on these edge nodes. Um, so you can have you know, a tier zero providing ECMP, equal cost multi-pathing in an active, active configuration. Um, and stateful service running an active standby on the same edge node pair. So it's kind of the, the services are making sure that they're available no matter who or what node that they're on. So coming back to these, you know, other HA modes, um, active active again gives you the ECMP and scale out. Um, and you can run stateless stateless services. Um, you know, for stateful services, you would need to run active standby HA modes for a logical router. And a lot of that is gonna you know, determine your traffic flow in the environment. So if, you're, so if you're in standby, it's truly in standby waiting for that other one to fail before traffic is gonna move over to it. In active standby HA, both service routers will maintain BGP peering with the physical router. The standby service router will receive all the BGP routes and keep them in or keep them available. Um, however, the southbound interface to the, to the tier one or logical switches is kept down. The standby ASR will also prepend, prepend its you know, um, area you know, three times to all advertised routes so that active path is always preferred. There's your show, I have BGP, Ken. See, we got there anyway. Edge node architecture. So Basic stuff here, the, you know, the edge node, you know, needs to encapsulate, decapsulate traffic to from compute transport nodes, um, you know, be it the, the overlay, especially, especially on an overlay transport zone. Um, the edge node also needs to send and receive traffic to from physical infrastructure, you know, like if, it, if we're talking about VLAN transport zones. Um, and the uplink profile applied to the transport node, again, when it joins the transport zone. Further, the, uh, the NSXT bare metal edge runs on a physical server um, and it's installed you know, using an ISO file or Pixie boot. Um, a bare metal edge differs from the virtual machine form factor um, in terms of performance. It provides sub-second convergence for faster failover and, and higher throughput at a lower packet size. Um, when a bare metal edge's node is installed, a dedicated interfaces, interface um, is retained for management. And if the redundancy is desired, then two NICs can be used for management plane high availability. So when a bare metal edge node is installed, uh, a dedicated interface is retained for management if redundancy is desired. Uh, two NICs can be used for management plane high availability. And these management interfaces can also be, you know, one gig each. And bare metal edge also supports in-band management where the management traffic and leverage interface being used for overlay or external north-south traffic. So in a multi-NIC NVIDIAS per edge design, um, as commonly called, this is what we refer to as like the three 
the three NVDS per edge, um, where you have multiple NVDSs. Um, the edge VM design recommendation is is you know it's valid based on you know it can can sometimes change based on the release of the software. So again, refer back to your design guide if you're doing you know this kind of edge node deployment advanced advanced edge node deployment where you're doing multiple overlays and multiple nvdss then we have the option of doing a, you know a single nvds overlay and external nvds where they're converged into you know a single nvds and this this carries both the overlay and external traffic However, different uplinks are used to carry overlay and external traffic. Um, Multi-tap is configured to provide load balancing for the overlay traffic on uplink one and uplink two. Um, and notice that the, you know, the TEP IPs use the same transport VLAN. All right. So wrapping up here um, with some topologies that you can build out with NSXT. So first we have, you know, a typical enterprise topology. This is a single tier topology with, with distributed east-west traffic and high throughput eight-way ECMP for north-south traffic. Um, you know, you have distributed, oh, I went too far. You've distributed firewall for east-west traffic. And if they're, you know, are some non-virtualized services, your servers, they can be connected to virtual networks, um, you know, via the, the, the logical segment bridge, via layer three or L2 if connected, you know, if, yeah, if L2 connectivity is required, then you do the bridge. Getting ahead of myself there. So next, this is the multi-tenant topology for tenant isolation, and you can, you know, programmatically provision these tenants via, via cloud management platforms. You know, this is where, you know, VRA and VRO and those kinds of tools come into play. Um, and you know, I, I even have customers who deploy these things um, via a, fully via API, um, as we kind of covered in back in the first first episode. Um, you know, and I've seen. Um, customers also do full deployments for tenant type topologies with um, Ansible playbooks. I mean, you know, the the ability to push these things out, these configurations out via you know multiple different tool sets and means is extraordinarily flexible in NSXT, um, and it's it's sort of the the next level of of, of networking deployment. And then we have, you know, strict isolation with a tier zero. So we have, you know, separate tier zeros and separate zones, you know, bridged across an external network. I mean, these things can get, you know, quite advanced very quickly. And, and you know, anybody who's, who's running through this stuff again, this is where your design guide comes in handy because it'll tell you if you're doing something wrong. And this is my favorite one because it's just the craziest design of all, you know, where we have a, a you know, a backbone of, you know, eight ECMP connected uh, tier zeros. Um, is this your home lab? I, I wish. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough gear to run all this. Um, but I mean, the, the, just the sheer amount of separation and um, connectivity that you can give you know, and then and again, that this is all done in software. Um, you know, this is truly next level mind blowing stuff. Um, so with that, are there questions? One popped up earlier, uh, and I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, it was from Graham, and I think he was uh, asking it in the context of the HA pairs uh, of edge nodes, if I got the right term, I forget. Uh, he wanted to know if they are just standard peers or is there some background communication? Mm. So the, the edge, I mean, if they're, 
if the edge nodes are in a cluster, then then they share you know all of the same information together. You know that because that's what gives us the ability to to instantiate those services um, and spread them across the cluster to make sure that they're highly available and always there. Um, you know if they're if you're just talking a one-off edge node, um, then then yeah, the high, high availability is not as baked in, I guess, because it's you know you're talking about single a single device of a single point of failure at that point i'm going to give folks a moment to ask any other questions they might have in that case and for folks who didn't get a chance to get any question in today uh don't forget you can reach out to Britain on Twitter. He's at VCXNV. VCIXNV. Um, VCIXNV. I'm sorry. Um, so while I was talking, Benjamin sent us a question. He wants to know, can we use L2 VPN with NSXT? You can. Um, there's several different options for VPN. Um, I, I did not get it d deeply into that. There's just too much other stuff to talk about this time around. Uh, but yes, there are L2 VPN connectivity options baked into NSX. Um, so if you wanted to, you know, do some layer two stretching across sites, um, you know, between NSXT installations, you certainly can do that. Very cool. I'm going to pause for just a moment to make sure no uh, more questions come in. But in the meantime, I want to remind folks, to keep an eye on uh, YouTube, this will be up shortly. If you you know tuned in late, you can catch the beginning of it there. Uh, Britton, thank you very much for joining us again for the series, mm -hmm. and thank you for continuing to do it for an another couple episodes. Britton will be back with us in two weeks, but we will have another uh, episode about VR and I with uh, Matt just next week, folks. So yes, hi in. highly recommend that one. Yeah, absolutely. So tune in then. Um, Getting lots, no more questions coming in right now, Britton. Just a lot of folks saying thanks. So we will see you next time and enjoy your night. I'm going to hit yep, stop recording you. now. <laughs>